So the floor, I'll just take a mic and the floor is yours. All right, uh, very good, very good. Uh, so welcome back, uh, welcome back. Mm. We are continuing to talk about applications of uh, sketching in numerical linear algebra, and specifically, we will finish the proof <coughs> of uh, the theorem on the slide, namely that the count sketch matrix with about a d squared number of buckets uh, is a subspace embedding with constant probability and uh, constant precision in that particular case. Uh, great, okay. So uh, just a reminder, this is the matrix itself, uh, exactly one non-zero per every column. B is the number of rows, also known as the number of buckets. Uh, and we are using this matrix to downsize the least squares regression problem that we are solving. Uh, reduce the number of rows uh, in this big matrix A uh, down to the number of buckets that is quadratic in D. After that, we find a one plus epsilon approximate fit by simply solving the uh, smaller problem. Good. So, excellent. Mm. Back to where we left off. Uh, right. So, uh, we said, oh, look, we want to establish the subspace embedding property. And the subspace embedding property is the property that the Euclidean lengths of all vectors in our subspace of interest should be simultaneously <coughs> preserved by our sketch. Um, Good, so how can we think about all vectors in the subspace of interest? Well, we get a basis for the subspace. We call that a matrix U. This matrix is N by D. It's a basis for a D-dimensional subspace of uh, Rn. Um, and the subspace embedding property says that with high probability over S, the sketching matrix, it must be the case that for any vector of coefficients on that basis, uh, this is a vector for Y, uh, the Euclidean norm of sketched version of ui, uy, is close to the Euclidean norm of the non-sketched version. But since u is a basis, it's just the Euclidean norm of y itself. All right, good. We realize that this actually is a statement about the spectral norm, um, about the closeness of the gram matrix of the sketched version of our basis uh, to the identity in the spectral norm. But this is the basis, u. Uh, S times u is the sketched version of the basis, so naturally we lose orthonormality a tiny bit, uh, but this is asking us to prove that we uh, don't lose it too much. All right, after that we said, well, we'll actually prove the stronger bound, namely uh, that the gram matrix of the sketched basis is close to the identity in the Frobenius norm, and that was great because a Frobenius norm squared of the difference between two matrices separates over the entries of the matrix. So at this point, if we're shooting for a Frobenius norm closeness bound, all that we need to do is take all pairs of basis vectors, ui and uj, there are d squared of those, and then we need to just compare the dot product between them as a predictable function. It's the delta function of i equals to j, uh, to the dot product between the sketched vectors. So that's what we want to prove, that basically hashing with random signs, which is what count sketch is, almost preserves dot products. For two vectors x and y in Rn, we want to prove that the dot product between count sketched versions is close to the original one. Great, so then we just uh, looked at uh, some example. Uh, we said, well, uh, here are two vectors in dimension eight, uh, and here's a hash function. Let's compare the dot product between the original vectors and the uh, hashed vectors. Some amount of observation reveals that the difference between the dot product and the dot product between count sketched vectors is basically a bunch of cross terms. If we have, a if we have some collisions inside a hash bucket, then we'll get contributions uh, corresponding to, for every two coordinates uh, in n that coll collided in this bucket, uh, we get the extra term, which is the product of signs times the product of the corresponding value. So in full generality, this is what it looks like. Mm. The dot product between count sketched x and count sketched y is the original dot product plus the sum over all buckets over all pairs of coordinates between one and n that are distinct, hash to the same buckets of this. 
Um, it's an unbiased estimator, simply because I can put expectations on top of everything, and the expectation for product of two random signs is zero. Good. So our task was to compute the variance, and this is what we will do now. Any any questions about uh, about the setup? Um, very nice. So what is the variance? It's just the expected squared deviation from the mean. And as we saw, the deviation from the mean is exactly this sum of cross terms over all the buckets. So we'll just go and square the sum and hope for the best. All right, so we squared the sum and uh, it, the resulting expression is uh, a little bit annoying. Um, there was a sum over all buckets and over all pairs of coordinates that hash into the same bucket, but we're squaring this. So now what happens is there are two buckets, B and B prime in play. Uh, with every bucket, B and B prime, uh, there are two coordinates associated, I and J, and I prime and J prime. So I and J are distinct, I prime and J prime are distinct, but they, they could overlap, uh, the two pairs could overlap. And there are conditions that i and j hash to b, i prime and j prime hash to b prime. Fantastic. So we need to understand the expectation of this. Uh, now, we just put expectation on top. Uh, but uh, before we put expectations on top, let's just color this expression so that it becomes a little bit more colorful and hopefully easier to understand. Uh, so we color everything related to b red and everything related to b prime blue. And here is the picture that goes along with this. So there's B and B prime, and the I and the J hash into B, uh, and uh, B uh, pri uh, I prime and J prime hash into B prime. Now the first observation is um, that if we take the expectation of both sides, then we actually get to ignore we get to just immediately drop all the terms where b and b prime are different. Why is that? Suppose that b and b prime are different. If they are, then the pair ij, the set i comma j, does not overlap with the set i prime j prime. But if they don't, then we are taking the expectation of a product of four distinct random signs we will assume that the signs are uh, four-wise independent. We need it for this analysis, in which case all of these terms are zero in expectation. Very good. Okay, so this so we we'll put the expectations on top, and this simplifies things a tiny bit. Uh, so now suddenly we don't have a B prime; it's just a summation over B. Uh, good. But the I and I prime, J and J prime, they still remain. So now we're interested in summation over all buckets. And inside a given bucket, there could be a number of coordinates colliding. So we're summing over pairs, i comma j, those are distinct, i prime, j prime, those are distinct, that hash into the same bucket. Good. So again, uh, we have these random signs that are four-wise independent. Uh, we note that, I want to simplify this a little bit more. Uh, Let's look at the inter overlap pattern of I, the set I and J and I prime and J prime. These are sets of size two. And I claim that if they overlap by one element, then the corresponding term is zero in expectation. Right. Because if these two sets overlap by one element uh, exactly, then the remaining elements are unmatched and they're zero in expectation. Good. So what does this mean? This means that uh, this means that there are two options. Uh, either i equals i prime uh, or i equals j prime. So there are two ways of matching things. So zero overlap is also zero. Zero overlap is also zero. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Zero overlap is also zero. Right. So the only, non, non, the only possibility that the product of signs is uh, non-zero, also known as one in expectation, is that either i equals i prime and j equals j prime or the other way around. It could be crossed. Good. And uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is what we get. Uh, right. 
So note that, yeah, so, so now we can write this as a sum over all, uh, before we had a sum over all i and j that hash into the, um, uh, into the corresponding bucket B. But we can rewrite this as a sum over all coordinates i and j. Um, and then add the constraint that they must hash to the correct bucket. Uh, i and j both hash to a given bucket B with probability one over B squared. So I removed, uh, I took the expectation over the hash function and put a one over B squared term up front. Okay, so uh, we also sum over B buckets, so let's just cancel one B, uh, and, and that's what we get. All right, um, uh, fantastic. Let's just simplify the right-hand side. Okay. Mm. So the right-hand side is over all i and j in n, i distinct from j. Let's just throw in the terms i equals j. These are non-negative, uh, and when i equals j, these are also non-negative. Mm. So this only increases the sum. Uh, so now we have the sum of over all i and j completely unconstrained uh, of xi squared yj squared plus uh, xi uh, yj, um, xjyi uh, squared. And so this is nothing but uh, the, well, the, the, first, uh, the first thing is just the product of Euclidean norms, squared of x and y, and the second uh, term is just the uh, squared dot product between x and y. Okay. Uh, now by Cauchy-Schwarz, this uh, second part is at most the first. So we get, uh, all in all, uh, we get that uh, the variance is upper bounded by, uh, well, at least this part of the variance is upper bounded by two times the product of Euclidean norms squared. Good. Any, any, any questions about this? Okay. Uh, good, good. So let's just restore the one over B uh, factor, just put this together. No, we, we have these two vectors x and y, and we wanted to understand uh, how close x transpose y is to um, count sketched x transpose uh, count sketched y. What did we get? Uh, we get that it's uh, basically one over uh, two over number of buckets that we hash into times the product of Euclidean norms close. Uh, so in particular, this means by Chebyshev's inequality that with constant probability, we get an additive error of one over square root number of buckets times the product of Euclidean norms. Note that if you were to just, let's say, uh, do JL, just do dimensionality reduction that preserves, uh, in, in that case, you need to, uh, say, project onto one over epsilon squared or so Gaussians, right? And then you would preserve Euclidean norms up to a one plus minus epsilon factor, and that's the type of guarantee you would also get for the dot products. So dot products you can uh, preserve up to the uh, bottom. Hmm? There's an SY. Oh, yes. Ah, thank you. Sorry. Uh, this is SY. Yeah. Good. All right. Uh, very good. So now we have a good bound on the uh, variance. Uh, well, the variance of. Um, on the variance uh, of our approximation to the dot product. But remember, what we really wanted was to prove that the gram matrix of the sketched basis for our subspace is close in uh, spectral norm to uh, identity. And we ultimately decided that it's enough to do Frobenius norm. Uh, let's apply our knowledge here. So what is the Frobenius uh, norm squared distance uh, between these two matrices? Well, Frobenius norm squared of a matrix is a summation of the square, squares of all the entries. So let's sum over all the entries of this matrix. That's a D by D matrix, right? So we're summing over all I and J and D. Um, and what are, the, what, what are the values, right? So this identity is just the gram matrix of the basis vectors. It was an orthonormal basis. And uh, the, the, the first thing is exactly the dot product between the count sketch vectors. 
So the expectation, oh, the expectation is missing here. Sorry about that, that's a typo. So this expectation here, expectation of the square is exactly what we just bound. Good. So for every i and j, this is bounded by two divided by b times the product of Euclidean norms squared of the corresponding basis vectors. So ui is our x and uj is our y. Um, good. So, uh, so what? Uh, at the end of the day, we get 2 over b times the square of the um, Frobenius norm squared of our u matrix. u was a basis. So every column, um, every column of u actually has Euclidean norm 1, right? So here inside the sum, I'm summing over all the columns of u. Uh, I'm summing the squared Euclidean norms. They're all 1. So actually what is inside here is d. Right. And then we're squaring it. But it's a, this is actually a convenient uh, form. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll get a more interesting result in a second using this form of the bound. Okay, so all in all, to summarize, this is 2 by b times the fourth, norm, uh, fourth power of the Frobenius norm of the basis. And that's d squared. Yeah, uh, 2 d squared divided by b. Yes. I'm just thinking through the variance calculation on the previous slide. Is it clear we had to do it again versus it didn't generically follow from the count sketch guarantee? Like we couldn't have looked at like SX plus Y and SX minus Y and like the variance on that would have implied the appropriate inner product. It just seems you approximate all two norms. We tend to get that inner product statement. I was trying to think if that's generic or just uh, an intuition. Uh, Oh, uh, are you saying whether, uh, is your question whether the bound on the variance that we just did uh, already follows from what we did in lecture one? Correct. Right, uh, good. That's an excellent question. The answer is no, it doesn't, uh, because it's, uh, it's one you know, it's one order up. It's, it's a different order of quantity, right? Uh, when we oh, were doing the original bounds, we were interested in understanding individual entries. Uh, so towards confirming this, did, did we actually need higher order independence to get that guarantee? Need independence. Yeah. Exactly. So here, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. So for example, here, uh, note that we needed four wise independence, whereas uh, the vanilla counts cache guarantee on approximating the entries of the lecture only requires two wise independence. Okay. Thank you. That was yeah. 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 So basically, the guarantees that we got for count sketch in lecture one don't, in particular, do not imply that uh, count sketch preserves is a dimensionality reduction for you. And now we have it. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Very good. Okay. Uh, beautiful. Uh, so, uh, so, 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 yes. Now we're done. Mm, all right. Because uh, we showed that the expected Frobenius norm square distance between this. Count sketch, the, the, the gram matrix of the count sketch basis, and the identity is no, 2d by b squared. Uh, and remember that we wanted this Frobenius norm squared to be at most epsilon squared with high probability. All right. So now we can just apply Markov's inequality. Just apply it here. So we just proved that the expectation of the Frobenius norm distance between our gram matrix and the, ident and the identity is at most 2d squared over b. So now if we choose b to be at least 2d squared over epsilon delta, uh, then, uh, then what? Uh, then the expectation of our Frobenius norm di distance uh, is at most um, how much epsilon squared uh, times uh, delta. All right. So the probability that it actually is bigger than epsilon squared is at most delta.
So this is by Marcus and Court. Okay. Hmm? Sorry, this square on the epsilon in the bound on B. Uh, yes, that's a typo, yes. That was meant to be epsilon. Just a mark. All right, good. Okay, and so in particular, then the spectral norm is at most epsilon, again, with probability one minus two. Very nice. Uh, questions, is everybody happy? Yes. So we, we did the proof by controlling each entry of this matrix, right? Yes. But is there intuition for why you expect the spectral norm for Venus norm thing to be tight? Oh, uh, good. So the question was, uh, we did the proof by bounding the individual entries in the, in the difference matrix, uh, right? And which seems weak, right? In particular, it, uh, methods that Sushant uh, mentioned, the ones that come from matrix Bernstein inequality, sort of go, st uh, go straight for the spectral norm. The question is, why is this, uh, why is this good? Uh, well, uh, well, well, well. Um, one answer is that it's good because it is, uh, right? Uh, it just so happens that the spectral norm bound fails exactly when the Frobenius norm bound does, All right? Uh, but I think that, uh, uh, I think that probably under some assumptions on the matrix itself, right? Uh, on the basis itself, uh, in particular, uh, if the matrix U is not really close to an identity on D coordinates, uh, then I think one can do better. And there, I think also probably uh, matrix uh, Bernstein bounds uh, will be helpful, All right? Um, yeah, but here, just because there are examples where these two bounds are the same. All right, uh, good, good. So, um, summary. We showed that if we count sketch into d squared by epsilon squared buckets, uh, then we get a subspace embedding. Namely, instead of searching for the optimal fit for the original problem, we might as well uh, measure the quality of fit in the reduced in the reduced space, and we get roughly the same results. So, some you know, we get a one plus epsilon approximate solution in uh, time uh, n and z of a, uh, time to reduce the size of the matrix plus. Uh, poly d by epsilon. So, uh, what is the poly uh, d squared? Uh, d to the fourth, rather, right? So, we have a d squared by d matrix. So, if we just use classical techniques uh, to do the inversion, then it will be uh, uh, fourth power. All right. Well, uh, remember that uh, as I started talking about this, I actually talked about the rich regression problem. That's uh, where we want to regularize and do we add a, a lambda. Euclidean norm of x squared a term to our objective function. I said that we'll assume that lambda is zero for simplicity, and I promised to get back to you on this, so now I will. Okay. Um, in general, as Sushant was pointing out, if lambda, the regularization term, is very, very big, this seems like an easy problem. So then solving this problem approximately shouldn't be all that hard. Uh, and indeed, intuitively, if lambda is big, then uh, we're essentially asking that we don't, we're essentially saying that we don't really care about eigenvalues and eigenvectors of A that are below square root of lambda. We'll make this precise uh, in a second. So generally, if A is approximately low rank relative to lambda, then we should be doing better. And indeed, we, we are. Uh, so here's a theorem that one can show, I think, from the same. Uh, the analysis will be roughly the same from the paper of Avram uh, and Guyan and Woodruff. For the regularized least squares problem, uh, we can find a solution, an approximate one plus epsilon solution, in time n and z of a plus poly of uh, poly of s lambda, uh, actually s lambda times d. So the, the, the matrix also, the d does not go down. All right. Um, where s lambda is the statistical dimension of uh, statistical dimension of a relative to regularization lambda. So, what is the statistical dimension s lambda? Um, it is the following expression. Uh, formally, it's the trace of a plus lambda i inverse times a, and that is also known as the sum over all j from one to d 
lambda j divided by lambda j plus lambda, where lambda j is the jth eigenvalue of a transpose a. Okay. Um, good. Let me give you some intuition for this uh, quantity. So why is this a very reasonable quantity? Well, first, I want to point out that uh, it, uh, it kind of has a, the same head and tail flavor as we saw in the count sketch analysis. Uh, note that statistical dimension of A up to constant factors is the number of eigenvalues in A transpose A uh, above lambda. Mm, uh, in, uh, in, in A actually, above lambda, plus the sum, eigenvalue, uh, sum of eigenvalues below lambda divided by lambda. So this is sort of similar to our analysis in count sketch where recall we needed the number of buckets that we hash into to be at least the number of head elements, uh, the top K that we're trying to uh, approximate. And then the estimation error was somehow the norm of the tail divided by square root of B. So the tail error is then evenly divided. Okay. Just one sec, I, is this, I'm wondering if we want the statistical rank of A transpose A rather than a, because A is a tall, skinny matrix. Yeah, I think I, that, that, that's what I've been aware and, of. And, and you should, like, as we, uh, the singular values should be comparable to root lambda, whereas yeah. this expression has them in linear. Yes, so I think it's yes, a statistical okay. rank of A transpose A. Yes, let's, uh, yeah, exactly. Okay, so here's a proof. Of, okay, <laughs> thanks. So what I wrote there was incorrect, but now there's actually a derivation. The derivation is correct. All right, thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, good. So basically, uh, how does this work? Well, recall that uh, in this proof that we did, uh, we worked with a basis uh, u uh, for the subspace, and the basis is, is what? Uh, is a times a transpose a to the minus a half. Now, that's the matrix u. Uh, and uh, right, so then the Frobenius norm squared of that matrix was the dimension of uh, the space, the number of uh, columns. Uh, now, we can, I claim that we can do the exact same proof, replacing the matrix U with uh, the matrix A times A transpose A plus lambda I to the minus a half. Uh, okay? Uh, and the Euclidean norm squared, uh, the Frobenius norm squared of that matrix U uh, is going to be the statistical dimension. Uh, the Frobenius norm squared of a matrix is the trace of that matrix transpose with itself. And so by some cyclic property of trace, we get exactly the, uh, the right thing. And indeed, as Sushant points out, it has to be a transpose. Yeah. So is it the case that basically you look at how many dimensions you need to solve this optimization problem? Yeah. And it's a good solution in that many dimensions. You basically, somebody will preserve that all those dimensions and you're fine. Is that? Uh... That's, that's roughly the intuition, right? So S is a one. You know, uh, this formula sadly is, is a bit wrong, right? So this needs to be a transpose A as we just saw. But uh, note that uh, this expression uh, is indeed uh, nothing but, up to constant factors, the number of eigenvalues above lambda plus the sum of eigenvalues below lambda divided by lambda. So let's take a moment to uh, verify that that is the case. Now, suppose that lambda j is bigger than uh, lambda, right? Uh, lambda j over lambda j plus lambda is roughly one uh, up to a constant oh. factor. You can drop the lambda in that case. If lambda j is below lambda, uh, then uh, in the denominator, you can drop the lambda j and get a factor two approximation. So you're basically just summing up contributions below. So what you're saying is correct, except it misses the fact that you could have a very long tail uh, that you, know, you somehow also have. You know that you get error for that, I guess. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right, um, fantastic. So uh, that's what I wanted to say about the vanilla uh, least squared regression uh, together with the uh, regularized version. Let me s uh, say a few words, okay, I do have a bit of time, that's great, uh, about kernelized versions of this, yes. Just before moving on, one more Frobenius norm question. Just, just building on that. So, suppose we had defined <laughs> subspace embeddings to be like the Frobenius norm approximation. So, mm -hmm. for, for all you, so we have this distribution over S such that for all you, like the Frobenius norm of U transpose S transpose SU minus I is like less than epsilon. Mm -hmm. Is the D squared over, is like the D squared dependence optimal for that? Or can you be better for that problem? Like, like what? 
how, how many rows would you need to have like constant probability of that being less than epsilon? Well, because, because of these, uh, these examples that I gave, right? So if your subspace is it's just a coordinate subspace on some few of coordinate sizes, right? right. You will not really be. Oh, so you're saying that shows that d squared is optimal. Yeah, yeah, these are tight. Yeah, so basically it doesn't matter how you define that. You can define subspace right. invariance um, by asking for the Hesinius norm bound. But, but yeah, basically because of, um, uh, because of coordinate subspaces. So in summary, and I think the other question, if, if you defined it as the Frobenius norm problem, what we just saw was optimal. If you'd wanted actual L2 subspace embeddings and there are constructions with less rows. Yes, and, yes, and uh, so L2 should be better, right? Basically. Then you can do D over epsilon no, no, uh, uh, no, that's Yes, not. I see, I see. So there are two questions here. So first, uh, can you generally construct a subspace embedding? Yes. Right? Uh, if you I understand that. So uh, if you uh, define the subspace embedding in terms of the spectral norm, right, then there are better const uh, constructions in terms of the number of rows. Yes. Uh, so you just take Gaussians. And exactly. Like you're happy. Uh, if you define it with respect to the Frobenius norm bound, these are optimal uh, anyway, right? Uh, okay. That was the question. No. I, see. I thought you were more constrained to count sketch. Uh, no, I was I wondering just the object from the rest. Yeah. So I was wondering if we saw the optimal thing for like for Venus norm subspace. Like imagine the scalar size sort of. Yeah. Is yeah. it an absolute? Okay. Happy, happy to discuss yeah. later, but uh, yeah, I thought it was, thought it was a helpful yeah, thing. Yeah, well, my my hunch would be that yes. This is a strong condition, right? You're, you're asking yes. for the Frobenius norm to be that small. Uh, yeah, my hunch is. And uh, indeed, if you uh, if you know more about your U's, uh, if you're far from a coordinate subspace, I'm pretty sure it would be better. I don't have any idea of that. Maybe somebody does. Thanks. Uh, all right. Oh, fantastic. So uh, let me talk a little bit about sort of nonlinear versions of this. So. So right now we were doing linear regression, so a bunch of data points and, and evaluations of some function, and we want to fit this function by a linear function of the data points. So a kernel ridge regression, which I will not really do the fine details of, uh, is the following question. We're given a sequence of d-dimensional data points, and again, here's a one-dimensional example, x1 through xn. And uh, uh, we're given this together with evaluations of some function. And we're trying to fit the function, but we're no longer trying to fit it with a linear function, but we're trying to find a fit from some class of nice smooth functions. So here's an example of, uh, an example of uh, some, some, some function evaluated. This is the true function. It's something weird, some sign of uh, a bunch of sines and cosines of sorts, uh, and uh, noisy evaluations. Uh, one can try to uh, find an approximation of this uh, from a class of smooth uh, functions. And for example, if you do kernel ridge regression with a Gaussian kernel, then you get a pretty good fit. I don't think I have a picture for that uh, right now. But the idea, for example, uh, is uh, if you're doing kernel ridge regression with a Gaussian kernel, you're basically saying that. Uh, you will seek to approximate the function of interest by a sum of Gaussian bumps around your data, your data points. Okay, so that's that's kernel ridge regression. It's a nonlinear version. Good. Uh, so the main computational effort in kernel ridge uh, regression is the following: where uh, given the data points, they define a kernel matrix. An example kernel matrix is the Gaussian kernel matrix, where the ij entry of the matrix is just e to the minus Euclidean distance squared, uh, maybe by two, uh, between your uh, data points. Uh, and uh, you want to uh, invert a regularized version of this and uh, do a kernel uh, a matrix vector product, uh, where y is the vector of labels. OK, so what is this kernel matrix in reality? This kernel matrix actually is the gram matrix of some feature embedding of your data points. So here's a pictorial uh, representation of this. Let's say the Gaussian kernel itself uh, is, in fact, the gram matrix of the n input data points. Let me draw the embedding for you. Okay, 
So uh, let's say the Gaussian kernel matrix can be thought of as A transpose A, uh, where this matrix A has an infinite number of rows. It, it's a little bit informal, but you know, that's, uh, that, that's how it goes. Uh, basically, the every data point Xi corresponds to a column of this uh, matrix, uh, right? Uh, and the column itself is just the evaluation of the function e to the minus x minus xi squared. So this is the uh, pictorial uh, depiction of the thing. The feature embedding of a point is, um, is an infinite dimensional object, just the evaluation of some Gaussian centered at this point. Good. Uh, good. And so now what we would like to achieve is, uh, is the following. Right now we designed subspace embeddings and subspace embeddings are the following object. Uh, they are embeddings that can be applied to the large dimension of some matrix A to reduce the dimensionality. And at the same time, we, uh, once we squish the large dimension of the matrix, we preserve the geometry of the corresponding subspace. Okay. So we, uh, We designed a random matrix A S such that with high probability uh, over S, following is true. This is for every y. Right. So we have a matrix A that defines a subspace. We squish the large dimension of the matrix while ensuring that the Euclidean norms of the squished and non-squished vectors are uh, preserved with high probability for every vector in the corresponding subspace. That's what we did. And now I would like to apply this in the setting of kernel matrices. So again, in the setting of kernel matrices, I'm given these n data points. Now, very important to the little n now is what used to be d, uh, right? And what is what used to be n, the large dimension, in this setting is infinite. And uh, okay, so I have this uh, matrix with an infinite dimension, uh, the the large one, and the smaller one is n. I would like to apply an oblivious subspace embedding to the large dimension. So one option is, of course, to try to count sketch, but uh, it's a little bit awkward because then it needs to map uh, the real line on, into some uh, buckets. So basically, what we would like to do is is to design a subspace embedding can be applied that can be applied uh, implicitly, without fully forming this uh, feature map, fully forming the the, uh, the actual high dimensional vector. Okay. And this is useful for uh, kernel ridge regression. I will not uh, get into the details uh, here. Uh, very much. All right, good. So this is, uh, the Gaussian kernel is one example of uh, a kernel. So another one that will be useful for the subsequent uh, discussion is the polynomial kernel. Here's another way to embed points. Let's say we can take a point X and map it to X, X transpose. So the second tensor power of, uh, uh, of X. So this would be the degree two polynomial kernel. But we can consider higher tensor powers. Okay, and uh, here's the question, can we design subspace embeddings can, that can be uh, applied implicitly? Good. Uh, so this brings us to our puzzle from the uh, first lecture uh, today, namely count sketch for matrices. This is really why, why we're interested. Uh, remember that there are these R parties that uh, held uh, vectors x1 through xr, mm, right? And uh, we were uh, then interested in finding the top uh, coefficients in uh, uh, in the sum of outer products of the xi's. Good. Um, good. So then we dis, uh, the, the, we, we define the following tensored version of count sketch, uh, where instead of having a single hash function that maps the n squared dimensional uh, domain down to b buckets, uh, we actually had two hash functions that map the individual coordinates. 
and uh, two sine functions, and we tensored them. So this is the construction of uh, the pay and uh, fun that I mentioned before, known as the tensor sketch. Good. So this is a, a sketch with uh, very structured uh, hash functions. As I mentioned, the answer to the puzzle was we should use Fourier transforms. So to compute the sketch, it is enough to just sketch the uh, vector x using sketch number one, sketch number two, and then one can convince oneself that all that you need to do is take these two sketches and convolve them, okay? Um, and this you can do using fast Fourier transform. So tensor sketch of fun. Uh, another very nice uh, exercise uh, that is related to the question of how much independence you need uh, for approximating uh, dot products uh, between uh, sketched uh, vectors is to compute the variance of do the same comp computation that we did just for count sketch, uh, except in the setting of this uh, tensored construction. All right. And uh, I will not uh, solve the exercise. It's, it's, it's an interesting exercise because that's where issues with independence come up. Uh, in particular, one can verify that the signs uh, that we get this way are not four wise independent. So the direct analysis uh, that we did, uh, the standard analysis does not quite go through. Uh, the problem uh, is that, for instance, if you take uh, two, uh, if you take uh, four points that are corners of a rectangle, uh, right, uh, then the sine fun the product of sine functions is uh, identically one. So, uh, despite the fact that you have four distinct points, uh, the corresponding contributions do not cancel. In expectation, you get a one as opposed to a zero. All right. Okay. So a nice uh, exercise. One can also ask how this could be extended to higher tensor powers, and uh, it can. One simply uh, tensors uh, as many uh, count sketches as one likes, and one can compute the corresponding sketch using uh, the fast Fourier transform as before. Uh, the count sketch analysis goes through. One can ask whether this tensorized sketch will give us a subspace embedding for the polynomial kernel of degree Q. And the answer is yes, it's the same uh, result of Avram Guyan and uh, Woodruff in 2019, except that this the dependency issue that I alluded to before really becomes serious. Um, while for degree two, uh, degree two kernels, um, the performance of this is uh, roughly as uh, good as for standard uh, count sketch. If the power of the uh, polynomial that you're interested in goes, uh, goes up, the dependence of the number of buckets is exponential. So you need three to the Q times statistical dimension squared buckets. And this is really sharp, so this is good. So here's an interesting question that we asked some, times, uh, some time ago. Uh, the question is, can one, can one uh, define a sketch with a polynomial dependence on the degree parameter Q? Um, and uh, here is an outline of uh, how this uh, can be done. So this is from a paper of myself with uh, a lot of other people. Mm. Essentially, instead of taking this beautiful idea of uh, pay and farm uh, that, that shows that you can by f of t tensorize a count sketch many times and very efficiently. Mm. One tensorizes in a slightly more careful way. Essentially, if you just take a tensor product of all the count sketches at the same time, the dependencies accumulate and they accumulate exponentially. Instead, uh, what we do is we uh, consider a tree of sketches if you want to tensor, construct a sketch for the qth tensor power of uh, your uh, vector, then this tree will have q leaves. At the bottom, just like in tensor sketch, you will have independent sketches of uh, the vector x, uh, except that these independent sketches will then be joined by intermediate nodes. And these intermediate nodes only use a uh, tensor sketch of uh, farm and uh, fe with a degree two and a sufficiently large uh, number of buckets. So somehow uh, I don't have uh, too much time to get into the details, but uh, if uh, the intermediate uh, sketches use a sufficiently large number of buckets, instead of having a dependence which is a fixed, ex a fixed constant raised to power Q, uh, one is able to get uh, a blow up of the variance that is uh, more like one plus one over the degree to power the degree, and this never blows up. So there's just some dependence on the uh, ultimate degree and the number of buckets in the intermediate. Great. All right. So this is just a rough outline. How does that? How does one apply this subspace embedding for for the polynomial kernel to the Gaussian kernel, which is 
a kernel of uh, great interest in uh, many applications. Uh, well, that's by uh, Taylor expansions. Good. So let me outline this. As mentioned before, the Gaussian kernel is what? The ijth entry of the kernel matrix is uh, e to the minus Euclidean distance squared uh, by two, perhaps, uh, between the two points. So just for intuition, let's assume that all the points uh, lie on the sphere of some radius. Let's say radius one. Uh, this is really not a problem, ultimately. Uh, then the uh, kernel matrix between points in the sphere is nothing but e uh, raised to power the dot product between the corresponding vectors, maybe up to some constant that depends on the radius of the points. Okay. One Taylor expands the exponential and therefore observes that the Gaussian kernel can be written as a sum of gram matrices of polynomial kernels of uh, various degrees. For example, the infinite sum is from k from zero to infinity, one over k factorial times the gram matrix of the kth tensor power of your data set. And then at the end of the day, all that one needs to do is sketch the individual, uh, uh, sketch the individual kth tensor powers and uh, out comes a subspace embedding for the Gaussian, uh, for the Gaussian kernel. There is one constraint here. Uh, our result is uh, pretty close to tight uh, under the assumption that the data set has bounded radius. Um, the reason why there is a dependence on the radius is that, well, you need to take the exponential and just truncate it after a certain number of terms. And how many terms you truncate it after is a function of the maximum Euclidean norm of your vectors. Good. Uh, this is nice up to this polynomial dependence on the radius, which I think is completely un uh, unnecessary. And uh, here's a very interesting open problem, namely remove the dependence on the radius uh, in uh, these um, uh, sketches for uh, kernel matrices. Essentially, the way I think about this is that, uh, now, this is trying to design a high dimensional version of fast multiple methods of uh, Greengord and uh, Rochlin. So uh, kernel matrices uh, arise prominently, uh, for example, in uh, particle simulations in uh, numerical analysis, where you have uh, n data points and they interact through some shift invariant uh, uh, force, like a gravity or electrostatic force. And uh, a very powerful method uh, known as the fast multiple method uh, was uh, due to Greengord and Rochlin in, uh, in the 80s, uh, led to a revolution in uh, particle physics uh, simulations. Basically, it uh, let, uh, lets one apply, lets one compute kernel matrix vector products or shift invariant kernels in uh, time nearly linear in the number of uh, particles in your system, except with one important caveat. Uh, the caveat is that uh, there, is a there is an exponential dependence on dimension. And indeed, these codes become very expensive in dimension three, for example. Uh, good, the way this works is by taking the data points, uh, partitioning in them into you know, geometric regions. Uh, there's some grids at various, uh, level, various levels of resolution imposed. And then inside every bounded box, one Taylor expands the kernel in some way. Okay. Uh, so the current state of affairs here, I would describe as uh, the Taylor expansions that the classical fast multiple methods uh, use in high dimensions suffer exponentially from the, from the dependence on the dimension. Well, if you do a Taylor expansion in dimension d up to precision epsilon, you'll typically get log one over epsilon to the d terms. So what we have right now is a method for sketching a high dimensional Taylor expansion in one cell of the fast multiple method, uh, but we don't know how to patch things together across uh, different scales. And that I think is a very exciting open problem. Uh, we recently made some nice progress towards it, I would say, uh, some meta sense. Uh, with uh, Moses and Eric Weingarten. Uh, it's not uh, quite the linear regression problem, it's more kernel density estimation, uh, but uh, it's, it seems relevant, so I'm uh, very hopeful. Okay, uh, good. Um, that's, uh, that's all I have on numerical uh, linear algebra through count sketch. Mm. I think, should we adjourn and then reconvene, what do you think? I um, wanted to, yeah. Maybe let's do questions and we'll have to. Yeah, yeah I want to do quite, we'll do quite, wanna, 
How about we do questions? Give us a quick taste of what to come after the break. We'll take a break. Oh, great. Yeah. So wait, let's first thank him. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, questions? Do you think you can read both of the panels in R and exponential dependence on the, on the dimension? I think so, yes. That's what I would like to do, right? Basically, right now, yeah, we know how to get rid of the exponential dependence on the dimension, but not the R. Yes, I'm very optimistic. <laughs> yes. I don't know how, but I think it's doable. What's a good way to think about the effective dimension of the Gaussian kernel matrix? Oh, uh, statistical dimension of the Gaussian kernel matrix? Is that the right notion of dimension? Oh, yes, thank you, Moses. Uh, right, I, uh, yes. <laughs> okay, so, uh, indeed. Um, it's an interesting question. How should we evaluate the sketching algorithms for kernel matrices? Yeah? Uh, statistical dimension is a very nice notion that uh, came out of uh, the work on sketching explicitly given matrices. And it makes a lot of sense. For example, if you ask the question, uh, I have a matrix um, which is expli explicitly given to me. Uh, let's say it has n rows and d columns. Now, how many bits uh, of information do I need to write down this matrix? All right, and uh, d times statistical dimension is a pretty good answer. Uh, why? Because you know, your matrix might actually be a projection onto an S lambda dimensional space. Maybe you just have a projection matrix. How many bits do you need to write down a projection matrix? It's D times S lambda. So these bounds are basically very natural. That's the information complexity of the uh, problem in some sense. But now, if I have a kernel matrix, it's implicitly given by some D-dimensional data points. And I'm thinking D might be it's just some, some polylog, uh, let's say. Make D large enough so that uh, it's high, very high dimensional, so nothing exponential works, right? Then the points itself, the points themselves can be described pretty succinctly. And at least I don't really see a reason anymore why you need number of points times statistical dimension of the matrix, number of bits to represent this. Uh, maybe just low rank approximations are not necessarily the best way to uh, do linear algebra on kernel matrices. Yeah, I, I don't yet have a good... Uh, Alternative, but 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 uh, the hope is that somehow one can uh, bring geometric information into into the picture. Yeah. But then, uh, for example, for the identity matrix, it has a very high statistical dimension, but it's also very easy to sketch, right? Uh, the identity matrix. Um, I guess I'm thinking the, about these tall and skinny matrices. When you mean identity, do you, uh, do you mean that? I mean, you can just consider a lot of very separated points, right? Then their kernel matrix would be an identity matrix. Right, so then numerical linear algebra with them should be very simple. I think I can. Yeah, but it has a high statistical dimension. Yes, exactly. So I think the statistical dimension, therefore, is not very nice. It's not good for kernel matrices. Yes, <laughs> I, I don't know what the equivalent is. That would be very nice to design. Any more questions? Do you want to say a few words about right. after the break? Yes, yes. So, uh, good. So, after the break, I will talk about graph sketching. And uh, I will uh, originally plan to cover graph connectivity using sketches, uh, but I don't think I, I have time. So, instead, I will just go straight for spectral uh, approximation of graphs using uh, sketching, uh, most uh, probably. Mm. We will learn how to solve the following abstract problem. So the problem is this. Uh, suppose that you, you bought a house. Okay? And it's a very old house, and you're worried about the wiring in the walls. Because the wiring is old, and it might overheat. Okay, So you don't have the plans for the house, uh, but you're looking at the wall. So here is the wall of your house. You don't know where the wires are, uh, but some old plans somehow tell you where the junctions between the wires are. So these are vertices of some graph. Okay, uh, So you look at this wall, uh, and you want to find the wires that shortcut. So these are wires of high effective resistance. Okay, uh, You want to know where they are, 
these are edges of some graph, uh, because well, they might overheat and cause a fire. Uh, so you need to find them. Well, what can you do? You're staring at this wall, uh, and you have a battery in hand. It's a bit of a funky battery. It lets you do this. You choose any pair of points, and then you send one unit of current uh, from one to the other. So it's a current source. OK? So you attach it, and then you feel the wall with your hands. <laughs> and if some spots are hot, then you know that there is a wire that overheats there. This feeling the wall with your hand will be the count sketch algorithm. Okay, uh, good. Um, and then the question is, how many tests do you need to do? How many pairs of points do you need to hook up your uh, funky battery to, in order to find all the shortcuts? Okay. So from Sushant's lectures, it already should be quite clear that to find all the shortcuts, it's enough to just take all, try all the pairs, quadratic number of pairs. And you know, a, a wire has high effective resistance. If under this experiment, it will you know, contribute a lot of energy. So you'll feel it. But you don't have all day. You don't want to run a quadratic number of tests. You want to do it faster. We will learn how to do this in about a linear number of tests. So the tests that you're doing are just for ST demands? So I'm saying all the tests you're doing are just for ST demands, or can they be? ST. We'll only do a point to point. We'll try, try uh, about n pairs. Great. Thank you very much. Right, so uh, we'll have a break now until 3.30. And look forward to seeing you all for the last talk of the day.